Hey everyone and welcome back to my PDE lecture series. In this video we're going to begin our study of PDEs by going over the basics and some definitions. The goal of this video is to answer three questions. We'll start by answering the most fundamental one. What are PDEs? The second question, put quite bluntly, is why should you care about PDEs? And the third question, which we'll be spending most of our time on, is what types of PDEs are there? So let's get to the first question. What are PDEs? A PDE, or a partial differential equation, is an equation involving a function and its partial derivatives. For instance, df dt equals d2f dx squared is a partial differential equation. What's different between a partial differential equation and ordinary differential equation is that now the function whose derivatives are involved is a function of multiple variables instead of just one. So in this example, f is a function of x and t as opposed to, say, an ordinary differential equation like df dx equals f squared, where f is only a function of x. The second question that I'm going to answer is why should you care? One big reason is that you have an exam coming up and you're watching these videos so you can do some last minute cramming. You know, you can't fail your exam because that would bring great dishonor to your family, so for the next few days you care immensely about PDEs. I don't blame you, but personally I have other reasons in mind. Some of those reasons involve how PDEs describe a host of natural processes, from heat conduction and fluid motion to quantum mechanics and Einstein's field equations, PDEs are present everywhere. In fact, it's not just physics, other natural sciences like chemistry and even biology use PDEs. That's why they're so important, and that's why you should care. Now let's go to the third question, which is what types of PDEs are there? The answer is that there are many types, and there are many ways you can classify PDEs based on certain criteria. For instance, you could classify PDEs based on their order. The order of a PDE is the number corresponding to the order of the highest partial derivative in the equation. What do I mean by this? Well, for instance, if I had a PDE given by di 2 f by di x squared equals di f di t, then in this PDE the highest partial derivative would be the term in which the function f is being differentiated the largest number of times. In this case the highest partial derivative term is the di 2 f by di x squared term. So the order of this PDE is 2. Now don't get confused if there's a mixed partial derivative. Just follow the same logic. So in this example where we have di 3f by di x squared di y equals di f di t, the highest partial derivative term has our function f being differentiated three times. So this PDE would be an order 3 PDE. Another way to classify PDEs is based on the number of independent variables. An independent variable is something we differentiate with respect to. So in the first example above, we're differentiating with respect to x and t. So there are two independent variables, x and t. While in the second example, we're differentiating with respect to x, y, and t. So there are three independent variables, x, y, and t. We can classify PDEs according to their linearity, whether or not the PDE is linear. What do I mean by a linear PDE? A linear PDE is one in which the dependent variable, the variable that's being differentiated, appears only in a linear fashion. So it's not being squared, it's not multiplying a derivative term or even itself, none of that. For instance, these two examples both involve linear PDEs. The derivatives in f aren't being squared, multiplied with each other, or being raised to some other funny power, none of that. In fact, even if I change this first PDE, to become di 2f by di x squared equals di f di t times tan t, it would still be linear despite the tan t term. Why? Because when we talk about linearity, we only require linearity in the dependent variable. Since t is an independent variable here, it doesn't count. However, if I multiply the left-hand side by something like f, then the PDE would suddenly become nonlinear. Another criterion to classify PDEs is by homogeneity. Whether or not a PDE is homogeneous or homogeneous, however you want to pronounce it. A homogeneous PDE is one in which every term involves only the dependent variable and or its derivatives. A PDE that is not homogeneous is aptly called non-homogeneous. 
Back to the two example PDEs we just had. Both of them are homogeneous since every individual term contains F or its derivatives. However, if I took this first example PDE and added x squared plus tan t, it would become non-homogeneous because now there are two terms which don't contain f, the x squared and the tangent of t. A fifth way to classify PDEs is by the types of coefficients they have. By coefficients what I mean is whatever is multiplying the term involving the dependent variables and its derivatives. So once again if we go back to our two examples, the coefficients of each of the derivative terms are all one. So we say that these two PDEs have constant coefficients. However, if I took the first PDE and multiplied the left hand side by tan x, then we'd have a PDE with variable coefficients. The last way to classify PDEs that I'll cover here is based on whether the PDE is hyperbolic, parabolic, or elliptic. We can do this classification for linear second order PDEs which looks something like a times the second derivative of f with respect to x plus b times the mixed partial derivative of f with respect to x and y plus c times d2f dy squared plus d times df dx plus e times df dy plus f times f equals g. These coefficients a to g are generally functions of x and y. A PDE of this form is hyperbolic if b squared minus 4ac is greater than 0. The reason we say that such a PDE is hyperbolic is that if this relation holds, we can use a bunch of variable substitutions to change x and y to eta and e respectively, and then reduce the PDE to the second derivative of f with respect to eta, minus the second derivative of f with respect to this e, plus g equals zero, where g just denotes the first order terms and everything else. Now this is very similar to the equation of a hyperbola in a conic section, which is why such a PDE is called hyperbolic. Similarly, a PDE of the form given in equation a is parabolic if b squared minus 4ac is exactly zero. In this case, if I use the right variable substitutions, then we can reduce a parabolic PDE to the second derivative of f with respect to eta plus g equals zero, in standard form, of course. Again, g represents the first and lower order terms. Now, this equation is very similar to the equation of a parabola in the xy plane, which is something like x squared plus y equals zero, and this is why such a PDE is called parabolic. Finally, an elliptic PDE satisfies b squared minus 4ac is less than zero. The right variable substitutions would reduce the elliptic PDE to the following standard form equation. The second derivative of f with respect to eta plus the second derivative of f with respect to this e plus g equals zero. Just as the hyperbolic and parabolic standard form equations were similar to the equations for conic sections, the standard form PDE for elliptic equations also looks like x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now the equation of an ellipse that is isn't actually a circle, but a circle is a kind of ellipse anyway, just as how a square is a special type of rectangle, so it doesn't matter. Note that if the coefficients a to g in equation a up here are constants, then the resulting PDE is either hyperbolic, elliptic, or parabolic. However, if the coefficients are variable, then it's possible for the PDE to be hyperbolic in some regions and elliptic or parabolic in other regions. Now that does it for this introductory video. Hopefully the definitions didn't get too boring, but now you won't have to worry about them as much in the next few videos, because next time I'm going to go over PDE solutions and auxiliary conditions. I'll see you later.